what do you think about uh, salience landscaping? You know, we talked about how a church environment might shame people and perpetuate some of these problems. What about salience landscaping? Like I grew up in the independent Baptist realm and they were constantly telling men and boys what not to look at, women how to dress, Mm -hmm. and getting on to men. Like if they caught you, if they caught your eyes drifting down to yeah. uh you know scan a woman's body something like that they would yeah, yeah. call you on it and catch you on it and preach oh, against it so and so this produced people uh, it seems to me that it puts all these issues right on the forefront that foregrounds them in their salience landscape so they can't even just go do normal things with normal people without this standing out to them everywhere. You mm-hmm. get these people who are completely dysfunctional in public because they can't go to the mall to buy a new pair of shoes because they can't stop looking at the girls because they get, you know, because that's all they yeah. ever hear about at church. I mean, what do you, yeah. what do you think about that idea? That well, that's, that's the, what we call the purity culture approach. Uh, so I have yeah. a video on that, the purity, a contrast, that sort of purity culture approach. You got a video I, on that. Okay. Yeah. I contrast that with what I call the sexual maturation and integration approach. And so when we just treat this as a sin issue, then, then yeah, you're gonna have these recommendations where you just got to bounce your eyes and you need to stay away from anything that might be a trigger of your, your lust. Yeah. And so even with say same sex attraction, we get guys who will not go to a men's meeting or men's group or men's retreat because, well, I'll be triggered being around other guys. I'm like, well, how are you going to get over that if you're avoiding it? Like it's actually the opposite that heals you of it. It's getting the good connection with guys. Yeah. It's yeah. the longer you, you, you're perpetuating the shame, the sense that you're mm-hmm. other, that you're different. It's the more you perpetuate that sense that it increases the uh, desire for it in an erotic manner. But the more that legitimate need is being met, the less you desire and crave it in an erotic way. Mm-hmm. So we need to help people identify there's, there's root, wounds and needs and distortions that drive these uh you know, the lust that we are trying to fight uh mm-hmm. in fact like i say just use the uh the lustful thought the concupiscence the the drive toward uh eroticization use that as your guide to what the underlying need really is focus on yeah. doing that that's see i want to ask about that so you it's pretty clear about um, same-sex attraction. Maybe, maybe there's a maybe they lack some kind of masculinity from their mm-hmm. developmental phase. Yeah. But what about? And this is an objection that I hear a lot. As a matter of fact, this came up on my channel recently with one of our guests. They're like, you know, uh, we're no different than same-sex attracted people because we want to do things. We have temptations to do things sexually that the Bible condemns also, you know, mm-hmm. and and I can attest to that having sure. desires to do certain things that are outside the boundaries. Yeah. So what, if, if I'm a guy and I'm feeling attraction that fulfilling it, fulfilling the urge, the hypothalamic urge of that attraction mm-hmm. would be say immoral or at least unwise. What, what is the underlying uh, deficit? What, what am I yeah. lacking that's driving that? So, there could be a few things, but the main idea is, all right, so what's the standard? The standard is in integrated attraction. You are attracted to the opposite sex, but not to use the opposite sex as an object for your gratification. Hmm. But you're motivated to bond with her. So in, in her being mode, not having mode, charitably, not categorically. That's the difference between love and lust. Love yeah, is about yeah. giving. Lust is about taking. Mm-hmm. So lust is about using someone as an object and just treating them as an object. This is one of the other things that Pope John Paul II, uh, back when he was Carol Wojtyla, talked about in his uh, the book he wrote before he became Pope, uh, Love and Responsibility. I did a whole mm-hmm. series on this back in like January 2023. So I would highly recommend checking out that playlist. Love and Responsibility. That's yeah, the playlist so I did, on your channel, on yeah, Psycho to, Bible um, channel there's a playlist called what is love and i'm I'm doing commentary on that book um so jp2 came up with this norm he calls the personalistic norm that a person is such an entity that
that the only good and proper response to them is love. Mm -hmm. That you view the uh, and what is love then to to harken back to like Aquinas is to will the good of the other. Mm -hmm. So that is going back to the attachment stuff I was talking about earlier with the developmental model. It's understanding that the other is good, mm -hmm. not just a good in two ways, a good in and of herself and a good for me. So that I understand that I'm a good gift and she is a good gift. And so we want to enter into this mutual exchange of life-giving love. Mm -hmm. When a man is objectifying a woman, there's a few potential things he's doing. He's one, not viewing her as a good gift or that's a good in and of herself, but looking to her as an object for his own gratification. Mm. And so there needs to be a greater appreciation for her innate goodness. And he needs to get in touch with his own goodness as a gift, not his own goodness to keep indulging and feeding, but to give to her. So there's often wounds within his own mm -hmm. sexuality or his own identity. It might not be at the gender identity level, but it could be at other forms of attachment. So, um, so say one of the approaches I, I work with guys with uh, heterosexual sexual addiction issues, mm -hmm. uh, I'll teach them some mindful tips to use when they have uh, an unwanted opposite sex attraction or lustful thought. Mm -hmm. I'll ask them, all right, first, so say you're lusting after this woman that you see in a pornography video, mm -hmm. okay? Ask yourself, if I were to encounter this woman in real life, how do you think she would think of you? Mm. And there might be a sense of inferiority that she would look down it's on him. It's the yes prime in uh, Fowler's terms, yeah. Mm. And so if I can eroticize this, then it makes it more approachable, all right? That's essentially what a fetish is, a fetish is to take something that has uh, associations of shame and fear, and then you eroticize it to make it those things that bring pain and shame and fear to make mm -hmm. them feel good. Mm -hmm. So you're fetishizing that woman, essentially, because you're not looking at her as a whole person. You're fetishizing parts of her, her appearance, or maybe just a certain body part. So because in true love, you're not just loving her body as if she's... Mm -hmm separate from our whole person you're loving the whole person which is the the fact that we are body spirit composites so there's your personality and your internal spirit and your body together yeah so that's yeah. that is what true integrated love is to so love the whole person not just her body part or her or with the way she treats you so there's something that you're looking for in that connection that is more uh, some sort of use of the other and that's something you've got to look out for. You can identify that um, when you have some sort of disordered attraction or lustful sort of habit. So there's like a genuine relationality to it. I never heard this done before until just a couple of weeks ago. I heard Jordan Hall take the three transcendents and he, you know, he recently converted to Christianity. Yeah. And so he, he takes the three transcendents of good, true, and beautiful, and he's like, one of the problems in Christianity is we tend we tend to start with what's true first. Mm -hmm. um, and he suggested that we start with what's beautiful first, and the be what's beautiful relates to relationality, and yeah. not not beautiful in the sense of a lustful image, but beautiful in the sense of recognizing the wholeness and something that reveals uh, more of a deepness about reality itself. Yes. Uh, when you see a connectedness and a wholeness and a togetherness to recognize that beauty, something in being mode. So this other person is a, is someone that I can be with. We can both be in a not be together, but be together instead of having each other in categorical ways, like interchangeable parts on a car mm -hmm. where whereas that's more like just that categorical true thing where we're, we're making truth, you know, makes distinctions. And so, Oh, uh, there's a distinction I want to make. You know, I can have you and I can fulfill this particular fetish that I have rather than seeing the whole and integrated. And maybe when you fulfill that fetish, maybe you're des destroying or harming part of the wholeness that is that other person. And why would you want to do that to them? It's yeah. like there's a soul behind those eyes. So sometimes 
<laughs> when if I find myself looking at somebody in an objectifying way, like a woman who's very attractive, I will imagine it's one of my guy friends uh, dressed up in a woman suit <laughs> to, <laughs> to remind me that I'm dealing with a human who's you know, there's a soul behind those eyes here. 